we've got detailed leak specifications for the Canon EOS R1. And if the rumor is to be believed, well then the R1 is definitely gonna live up to expectations and be the master of everything. It's gonna come in two models, the R1 and the R1X. The R1X being a ruggedized version. It's gonna have a new stacked sensor and it's gonna have a new image processor. In fact, it's gonna have two of them. And in terms of continuous stills, well, it's gonna be faster than the Nikon Z9 in all modes. And that's thanks in part due to a new storage system that's gonna be faster than CF Express Type B cards. Curious? Well, we got the details after this short message. But first, please do me a favor. Follow me on Twitter, subscribe, share, choose all notifications, like, comment, and all that great stuff. It means an awful lot to me. It's greatly appreciated and really helps this channel grow. I've never seen such bold specifications for a camera, well, a consumer grade camera. I mean, these kind of specifications that I'm gonna to get to in just a short moment, there's something you'd expect to see from NASA on one of those, well, deep space probes, but certainly not something you'd expect in a stills hybrid camera. The Canon EOS R1 is gonna come in two models, the R1 and the R1X. The R1 is gonna be built similar to the R3 and the 1DX Mark III. It's gonna be weather sealed better than the 5 series and also the R series. But the R1X, well, it's gonna be a ruggedized version of the R1 and it's gonna be designed for climates such as, well, it's gonna be as equally as home in the Sahara as it will be in subarctic conditions. The R1 is gonna have a new sensor, but it's gonna be a stacked full frame sensor and the resolution, are you ready for this? You probably need to be sitting down. If you got something in your mouth, swallow, take your time. You ready? Okay. It's gonna be 102 megapixels. That's right, 102 megapixels stacked full frame sensor. This is a first from Canon. And while we knew that Canon was working, or it rumors at least told us that for the last, what, three years now, that Canon's been working on a, well, a sensor somewhere around 100 or north of 100 megapixels. But to see it in the R1, well, that is very bold for a stills fast action camera. Huh. Well, wait till we've got, we've got more information coming up that's gonna help explain how it's gonna be able to deal with that sensor size and all that information. But being a stacked sensor that's also backside illuminated, that will help it to gather more light. And even though we've got a lot more pixels on the same sensor size, it's gonna be able to do better in terms of low light and dynamic range. And of course, move that information off the chip quicker. And in terms of moving it over to the image sensor, it's gonna have a new Digic 11 image sensor, and not just one, but two of them. It's gonna have in-camera AR and algorithmic learning capabilities. Ooh, that's a mouthful, isn't it? But not only that, it will also have a new AI chip. Now, I don't know what it's gonna have in terms of AI. It's probably gonna borrow or take all that stuff that Ken has been doing with deep learning that started with the 1DX Mark III and put it all into this chip, and then probably do what Sony's been doing with the A7R5 and let other parts of this camera, other capabilities, pull and use different parts of the deep learning or the AI capabilities. And it's able to process ProRes in all resolutions internally. That's right, we have ProRes on this camera. More details on what type of ProRes it is coming up, as well as the other video codecs available in this camera. But now let's take a look at the stills capabilities. The Canon EOS R1, of course, has a 102 megapixel sensor, and in terms of continuous shooting at that full resolution, 30 frames per second. And I know that's a staggering amount of information to be able to process it really quickly. And you're probably doing your math, so I'll give you a moment. Yeah, need a bit, sure. Okay, you got it? Yeah, that's around 3.6 gigabytes per second. I agree, that will not, that's not fast enough. Well, it's not that it's not fast enough, it's that CF Express Type B's kind of cap out right now at around 1.5 gigabytes per second. I've got the Angel Bird upstairs, it's got 1.48 gigabytes per second. That's sustained write speed, maximum sustained write speed, but that's what it can sustain throughout the entire card, whether it's full or empty. So 3.6 gigabytes per second. Now we can put in a faster buffer and a larger buffer to be able to help offset that, but I'll get to that in just a short moment. Let's talk about some of the other resolution modes. So at 50 megapixels, or there about 50 megapixels, it can shoot 40 frames per second. And at 12 megapixels, it can shoot a staggering 140 frames per second. Now those aren't the only video, or sorry, not video modes, those aren't the only continuous still shooting modes. Those are just the ones I've been provided with. So how on earth is it able to sustain a write speed of 3.6 gigabytes per second? Is it a combination of a bigger and faster buffer? Well, I definitely think that the buffer's been improved. I don't have any information on that but the Canon EOS R1 has a completely new storage system. Gone are the days of CF Express Type B. That was so 2020. The Canon EOS R1 has dual CF Express Type C card slots. 
So how does a Type-C card compare to a Type-A or a Type-B card? Type-A has a maximum theoretical speed limit of about 1 gigabyte per second, a single PCIe lane, and it's the smallest at 20 millimeters by 28 by 2.8 millimeters. However, the maximum speed that you can ever expect to get out of a Type-A is about 900 megabytes per second. Type-B is slightly larger at 38.5 millimeters by 29.8 by 3.8. It has two PCI lanes, doubling the maximum theoretical speed to two gigabytes per second, but the real world maximum is unlikely to exceed 1.8 gigabytes per second. Type C is the largest CF Express card by 54 millimeters by 74 by 4.8 millimeters. It once again doubles the number of PCIe lanes in the previous type, Type B, to four lanes, further doubling the maximum theoretical speed limit to four gigabytes per second. But once again, real-world maximum caps out at around 3.6 gigabytes per second. But these speeds and capacities are based off of CF Express Gen 3. But if we forecast Gen 4 capabilities, which are not yet available, we see significantly more potential. Notice the difference in real-world specs. Type A can now achieve 1.8 gigabytes per second out of a theoretical 2 gigabytes. And Type B cards, well, they can reach 3.6 gigabytes per second while Type-C cards can reach an astonishing 7.2 gigabytes per second. However, if I'm a betting man here, I can expect that the new cards in the Canon EOS R1 are going to be based off of Gen 3. I do have some leaked images that were provided to me, and we've got a few of them. They're rather detailed enough, but still, while they're detailed enough, it doesn't give me a whole lot of information. There's no branding on this card, as you can see here. There's nothing on the top, the bottom, or the sides. Nothing to denote the manufacturer, let alone any sort of serial or identification information. And we can see it sized relative to a UHS-2 SD card slot, as well as a 2TB CF Express card. And both of these are Angelbird cards, so that has me believing that this is probably a prototype from Angelbird, because if you notice in the background there, you see a box, and what does it have on it? And I'm assuming it's a box, because look what it says. Don't look. And if you bought anything from Angelbird, well, then you'll know that they send you a box, and on it, it says, don't look. So anyhow, let's go take a look back at these pictures. While there isn't any identifying information, you can see that it is possible to zoom in a little bit here, and we can see the actual card or where the pins are. And again, I don't know how far this prototype is to being finalized, but this gives us an idea of the size and dimensions of this card. And wow, CF Express Type-C cards give you some maximum theoretical of 4 gigabytes per second. So 30 frames per second, lossless raw at 102 megapixels. Yeah, the, the storage can definitely keep up. The R1 doesn't have a mechanical shutter with a maximum speed of 1 64 thousandths of a second. And IBIS, it does have IBIS, but it's got eight stops. And no, I know what you're thinking. It's not eight stops with the lens and the body combined. That's IBIS, internal in-body in image stabilization, eight stops. The metering range of the R1 is between minus 8 and 25 EV. And the flash sync, well, on the R1, it's variable. The ISO range for the Canon EOS R1, get ready for this, is between 100 and 819,200. And no, that's not the extended range. The extended is from 50 all the way up to 1,638,400. Yeah, that's a pretty significant increase. But keep in mind, as we double or as we increase, we double up. So to go from 200 or 102,000, it goes to 204, then 408, 800, and you get it. And after 800, it's 1.6 million. And now it's time to take a look at the video specifications. The Canon EOS R1 is capable of 12K video at 24, 25, and 30 frames per second. Now, in terms of the different codecs, it can do cinema raw light but it can also do 16-bit 12K video. That's pretty impressive. But it also copies some of the same modes that you see in the Canon EOS R5C. And that's, uh, let me make sure I read this correctly, at Cinema Raw, LT, ST, and HQ, same as the Canon EOS R5C. But what about 8K and 4K video modes? Well, the Canon EOS R1 can do 8K from 24, 25, all the way up to 120 frames per second. So that's 24, 25, 30, 50, 60, 100 and 120 frames per second, and that's 12K oversampled 8K. Truly impressive. Now, in terms of 4K, we can do 4K 24, 25, 30, 50, 60, 100, and 120 frames per second, and that's in 12K oversampled 4K. The camera can also do slow motion at 120, not 120, sorry, 180 and 240 frames per second. 
but it's not full sensor, it's not oversampled. Now surprisingly, the Canon EOS R1 doesn't do 180 or 1920 by 1080, but if you shoot in 4K, you can always downsample in software, it's not that big of a deal. But what about codecs? What can the R1 do? Well, it does give you a choice between H.264 and H.265 in all video modes. Uh, and in terms of log profiles, this is a little bit different from the R5. We have Canon Log 3, but we also have Canon Log 2. And we have a new format, or not format, sorry, a new log profile, and that's Canon Log 4. We also have the native Canon XAVC, and that's 12-bit and 10-bit 422 internal recording, but we also have Apple ProRes RAW. And we have Apple ProRes RAW, according to the leaked specifications, in all video modes. So that's pretty impressive. Apple 8K RAW. Now, for me, I don't use RAW nearly as much. I'd be happy with 422. What I'm shooting most of the times, with the exception here, I'm shooting in 8-bit, but most of the times when I'm shooting log, I'm shooting Canon Log 3, and I'm shooting it in 422. That's more than sufficient for what I'm shooting. I'm no Steven Spielberg, after all. I'm an ordinary filmmaker, not an extraordinary filmmaker. And now for the autofocus capabilities. The Canon EOS R1 can do quad pixel autofocus. Now, this isn't new to mirrorless cameras. Earlier last year, I don't, what was it? Was it OM Systems or Panasonic with the GH6? Either the OM1 or the GH6 got quad pixel autofocus. I just can't remember which one. So the R1 has quad pixel autofocus, but it also has LiDAR assist. And what that's used for is if you're gonna be shooting in low light situations or pitch black, what LiDAR is going to be able to do is going to be able to line up to properly focus on your subject. So when you go ahead and snap the photo and the flash goes off, everything's going to be in focus. And this is something we had with DSLRs, not LiDAR, but we have that capability with a flash which set off an infrared. And uh, yeah, we don't have that with mirrorless cameras. So that's something nice to have back in the camera, or at least a feature. So it's using LiDAR Assist as the name of that capability. Like the R3, it has eye-controlled autofocus. Hopefully it's a little bit better. Now, depending on who I talk to, Eye-controlled autofocus is a great feature. Others, well, they say it's a gimmick. Now, in terms of autofocus and eye detection, well, it's got human eye detection, bird eye detection. It's even got cat, dog, and insect eye detection. But it can also track planes, trains, and automobiles. It can track motorcycles. And if somebody's wearing a helmet, so you're doing motorsports, it will lock onto the helmet. If it can't lock onto the helmet, it will lock onto the front of the car. Uh, pretty, pretty intensive. It can do trains as well, different types of trains, freight trains, high-speed trains. Uh, nothing mentioning about boat, but it does mention one other thing, and it's small object detection. I'm wondering, are we finally getting some sort of UFO detection? The way this is supposed to work is if you're trying to track an object that's really small relative to the background, and with a 102 megapixel sensor, that can happen more often than not. So what it's going to do is it does its best to lock onto this object, whatever it is, whether it be a small plane or a bird, whatever it is, it's going to lock onto it, auto expose and auto focus for it so you can nail those shots. Normally when you're shooting anything small and planes are notorious for this, when you try to focus and zoom on it, um, the, the especially on a sunny day, the, the, the background is so bright that, you know, things either become overexposed or underexposed and you pretty much lose all sort of detail and usually they're overexposed. So it's kind of nice to have that improvement as well. So autofocus is greatly improved on the Canon EOS R1. So we got quad pixel autofocus, LiDAR assist, and of course the tracking of more subjects and more reliable as well. The Canon EOS R1 has something called internal heat control, and it allows the camera to operate in environments that go from 40 degrees Celsius all the way down to minus 40 degrees Celsius, or about minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, all the way up to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So how does it work? Well, this internal heat control has internal warming, a new thermal architecture that allows it to operate in those temperatures. And if you're shooting in, well, subarctic conditions or my backyard right now, anything like the Antarctica or where it's minus 40 or close to minus 40, then it has some internal heat that's gonna come on in temperatures below minus 20. And this is something that you have to enable. It's not always gonna be on and it starts to heat up the camera internally. So you're gonna be able to shoot in colder environments. And this is really, really significant. No longer are you gonna to have to put batteries in your pocket to keep them warm. You can use it in camera. You've got this feature that can keep the cameras warm enough. And of course, it's gonna allow you to, well, shoot all the way up to about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And it has better internal, uh, I don't know what the details are, but it has better in thermal architecture to help keep the camera cool and so it won't overheat. So that's pretty impressive. Now this kind of 
segues a little bit into the battery. The, it has a new battery, a five, uh, what is it, 40, let me just take a look here. 59, no, 4,900 milliamps. Um, that's almost twice the R3 or the 1DX Mark III. That'll give you about three hours of video or about uh, 5,000 shots. But the battery here, it also has um, what is called a self-heating battery. Now, I don't know if this is part of the internal heat control, whether it's a combination of things that are provided in the battery or there's a miniature little heater, an HVAC system inside the camera. But the battery does have, and I'm gonna read it here so I quote it properly, a self-heating battery. So pretty impressive there. This is pretty interesting. Now, again, it doesn't mention whether this is the R1 or the R1X. And now for the back of the camera, that LCD, it's a 3.5 inch for access LCD. And the EVF, take this Sony, 10 million dot EVF, 120, uh, 120 hertz blackout free. So nothing crazy like 240, uh, 120 mega, or megahertz, 120 hertz blackout free. That's pretty standard for any, any camera these days. So it's good that we see that. Now in terms of other ports on this camera, it has a headphone jack and of course a microphone jack and HDMI, I'm smiling, you know why, because it's a full-size HDMI slot. And it also has an SDI port. I almost said an HDMI port, so it has an SDI port. And well, the list goes on. We also have two USB ports, and one of those is a Thunderbolt port. So that helps us get information off the camera quickly if we're not taking out the cards. And I'm really curious, those dual CF Express Type-C cards just like the R3, the Canon R1 is a little bit thicker, a little bit taller, and the ruggedized version is not nearly as uh, smooth and ergonomic. Well, I shouldn't say ergonomic, sorry. Not nearly as smooth with smooth lines. It's something a little bit more, well, boxy, because if you've seen any th ruggedized devices, whether it be phones or laptops, they generally have the corners protected and they look alike, well, they look a like a football player. They're a little bit more bulky. The camera also has internal GPS and a micro SIM port. Now, in terms of the weight, I'm going to read this right off of the spec sheet here. It's supposed to be 5.136 pounds, and that's for the R1X. The R1 is 4.825 pounds, and it's composed of a magnesium alloy. And um, I'm going to read this off here. Um, an optional magnesium dominium shell for maximum heat dissipation. Now, in terms of pricing for the Canon EOS R1 and the RX, or the R1X, I don't know. There's no pricing included here. Um, initially, I had speculated that the Canon EOS R1 would basically take the regular price $64.99 and could apply around 68% increase due to inflation. But we've also seen the, well, US dollar increase dramatically against the Japanese yen. And when Canon released the R6 Mark II, it had the same price as the R6 Mark I. So because of the high US dollar, I don't think there's going to be a lot of pressure to increase the price in US dollars. However, if you're in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Germany, France, anybody on the continental Europe or um, UK, I guess you're still called Europeans, right? That, I don't know. Did Brexit separate from being Europe or are you still European? Let me know in the comment section down below. But if you're from any of those countries, you can expect the price of the R1 to be increased over the 1DX Mark III by as much as maybe 10 or 12%. But in the United States, it's really hard to say. Anywhere from no price increase up to around $7,000 is my price range at this point. For the R1X, I don't know. Um, it depends on what kind of materials they're using to produce that ruggedized system, that shell. So yeah, anyhow, if you wanna stay up to date on the latest camera news and rumors, go ahead and subscribe, but make sure you choose all notifications. And by choosing all notifications, you can stay up to date on the latest camera news and rumors. Just make sure you check your spam and junk mail folder because a lot of times these email messages come in there. But if you choose all notifications, they'll also, they'll also come in at the top when you're in YouTube, that uh, bell icon, you'll get a notification there as well. But that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed this video. Have yourself a great week. It's Sunday, it's April, and well, spring is finally underway. We've got so many birds outside. For the first time ever when I was producing this video early in the morning, I could hear birds chirping outside. and It was so amazing. I love hearing the sound of birds. That's a, that's a real sign that spring is here because we hear the birds long before we see the flowers. But that's it for now, guys. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again soon.